Thanks a lot for the introduction. Uh, thanks to the organizers for organizing all of this. Thanks to ICTS uh, for hosting this. And uh, so my, so I'm, I, I split my time between uh, Leiden University and uh, Lucca in Italy. Um, and this work is actually in collaboration with people from both institutions. So there is an ongoing collaboration between these institutions. But first I would like, uh, so as a disclaimer to clarify once more that I'm a physicist, uh, and here, I mean, I feel like a little bit in a cage with the lions, right? <laughs> so uh, I, I will not present the standard mathematics uh, talk, so I'm not going through uh, the, the derivation of the results that are here. So I would like to emphasize a physics take on the, on the relevance of certain uh, problems and questions in, uh, and how we try to address this, um, these questions with this work. Okay, so first let me guide you through a series of keywords uh, that you see already in, in the title. So, okay, network, I don't have to explain because we're all here because of this. But the idea here is to propose a uh, notion of renormalization of networks, where by renormalization I mean that sometimes, very often, you need to look at a network from uh, multiple levels of resolutions. Uh, so you can imagine you have your system, which consists of nodes and links, but sometimes uh, you are uh, forced or willing, at the very least, to look at the same system after aggregating the nodes in different ways. This can be uh, because of data reasons, so sometimes you do not see the individual links in your system, but maybe you know that certain aggregates or nodes are connected in a certain way. So sometimes the data tell you something about nodes that are defined at a given um, hierarchical scale. For instance, you are interested in a network of firms that uh, trade among themselves. So you're interested in a production network, for instance. Data about uh, business relationships are confidential. So it's very hard to see the links between these firms. Maybe you have data for firms in a given country. So you know all the links between nodes that belong to a certain country. But then there are also links that go outside of that country to other firms that are elsewhere. But that elsewhere for you, at least for the data, is an aggregate of all firms in a second country. So then you see links from one firm node in country A to the aggregate of all nodes in country B. So then you have a macro node, which is actually country B, which is clearly at a different hierarchical level uh, with respect to your nodes. So there, uh, if you want to say model now your network, what kind of, what is the right level of resolution at which you can model your network? If you have say a random graph model that you would ideally apply to the fundamental network of firms, fine. But then, for instance, you cannot fit this model if you don't have access to all the, all the units individually or to all the links there. So sometimes you need to have a multi-scale approach. So when in the same network, there are nodes that coexist at different scales. This might be a practical reason. Sometimes the reason is not practical, it's just that you're curious whether certain network properties that you see at, in your network uh, remain stable after you coarse grain your network according to a rule that you can choose, okay? So there are both applied reasons and theoretical reasons why you want, would like to pose the question, what is a random graph model that in a sense lives not at a single level of resolution, but at multiple scales of resolution? And if you have your random graph model well-defined at one level, will it still be well-defined at higher coarse graining levels or not? Uh, do you have to change your model when you're looking at the same system but simply changing the level of resolution, okay? Or is there a model that can encompass all the different resolutions level uh, in one shot in a sense? Okay, so consistently. Will the model remain consistent with itself across different levels of resolution? So, of course, theoretically, this resonates very well with the idea of renormalization that we have, um, for instance, in statistical physics, where you think of coarse graining uh, a system, could be a system of spins living on a lattice. There, the rules of the game are quite simple. So how you coarse grain a lattice is quite easy because the lattice has certain symmetries that you want to be preserved along the renormalization flow. But if you have a network where those symmetries are not manifest, at least, what do you do? Okay, so this is the idea behind um, 
renormalization and multi-scale, okay? Then the question is whether your model remains scale invariant in the sense of aggregation invariant or not, or whether the properties of the system remain the same across different levels. And then here, the, other, the last keyword is geometry. Why geometry? Because from the physical point of view, it's very important to, uh, I mean, understand whether geometry plays a role in uh, the structure of real networks. So Pim started this workshop with a very beautiful presentation where he clarified that there are, let's say, classes of models where you can explain certain recurrent network properties uh, without geometry. So in particular, you can have models that replicate uh, broad degree distributions quite easily, uh, assortativity profiles maybe quite easily, but sparse networks quite easily. The small world property is easiest because already the Erdosheni has it. Uh, but the finite local clustering coefficients is a feature that is very hard to uh, realize with models that have independent edges. And that's why the notion of geometry was introduced as the notion of maybe nodes that we see in real networks live in some latent hyperbolic, not Euclidean space, where then by virtue of the triangular inequality, you have a lot of local triangles. So your clustering coefficient will be non-vanishing. And at the same time, the hyperbolicity generates this broad redistribution. So in a sense, we are also interested in determining whether geometry, which in a sense is the, uh, initial step in every renormalization procedure, if you think about it, is really necessary in the network setting or not, okay? So that's more or less the, uh, is, that's perfectly true. And in this particular model I'm talking about, the renormalization procedure will be exact. Because it's a model that on some respects is quite easy, very straightforward, it's a model with independent edges, but it's constructed in a way that there is an exact mapping between a random graph ensemble defined on one scale of resolution and the result, the induced random graph ensemble that you have after you coarse grain nodes in the way you like. So up to renormalization of parameters, so rescaling, pure rescaling of parameters, which is unavoidable, uh, the renormalization step will be exact here, okay. Okay, so motivation, so as I said, if you have traditional, say, statistical physics models like Ising or whatever on a regular lattice, it's quite immediate, straightforward to think how you want to block nodes. You can do many, in many ways. This is not unique. There is scheme dependence sometimes along the renormalization uh, flow, but then eventually you're interested in what will be independent of, of schemes. But the idea is simple. So you have a lattice with a certain symmetry, you want to keep that symmetry. So you, want, you have a grid, you want to make a grid, an effective lattice with exactly the same symmetry. And then if on top of that, you have a, a model for, with spins or other degrees of freedom, clearly you also have to define the rules for, okay, uh, what, what is a block spin? Okay, is it a majority rule uh, chosen or is it the average? So that, that is also, something which is up to you. But my focus here is on the structure of the graph which underlines the, the, the problem, right? So if you then think of now you, you leave the, the paradise, the, the garden of Eden of the regular lattices, and you enter this, the jungle of uh, complex networks, this is truly not immediate. So what, what is now the symmetry you want to preserve? Do you want to preserve a symmetry or do you want to think of more general ways of coarse graining nodes, right? So there are many rigorous definitions in the difference between a regular lattice and a real network and what it implies for renormalization. So here, uh, I want to give up trying to be as rigorous as the audience. So I chose an Italian joke for the definition. So in a sense, the difference is like if you think of renormalizing a tray of ravioli, it's quite straightforward to think of a two by two hyper raviolo where you can map this tray onto itself, right? Preserving the same symmetries, but it's much more different to think of renormalizing spaghetti. Okay, so what is a renormalizing, what is a hyper spaghetto in a sense, and how do you preserve the properties of the system? Okay, so I accept this as, please, this would be my definition of the challenge. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> With rice, it's still uh, easier. Uh, Okay, so uh, now 
what are the explicit problems in networks when you try to renormalize? Well, first of all, there is no obvious metric structure when, if you only look at graph properties. So if you're given an adjacency matrix, you may suspect that there is some geometry underlying. Tim also was mentioning the question, okay, how do we know whether the graph that we see comes from some geometrically embedded set of points, okay, that have been connected according to nearest neighbor preferences, and that can we, can we invert the process and guess what the geometry underlying is. I think Nelly tomorrow is also going to think, uh, to talk about geometry in, in networks. And, but the problem, the point is that there is no obvious, not, no explicit coordinates that we are given when we see the nodes, okay? So in a lattice, the, high, the guiding principle behind the renormalization is that you have the coordinates of these nodes in a lattice. So this is what drives the definition of the block nodes who will belong to which block node is clear from the geometric coordinates. We don't have this for free, at least in, in networks. Then there is the scale-free property, so broad degree distributions imply that if you pick a naive rule for defining the block nodes, you are very easily uh, in trouble, because if you cannot say that my block node is a node plus its nearest neighbors because the nearest neighbors will not agree. Because for a hub, the nearest neighbors are a huge fraction of all nodes in the network. He would like to take all those nodes into his own hyperblock. Whereas for the poor guys that are only connected to the, to the hub, they will all compete for having the hub in their block nodes, right? So there is no consistency in a sense in neighborhoods. Uh, and this, you may think this is still a kind of scheme dependence, but it's more dramatic, I mean, than, than, than what you have in, in lattices. And then the small world property also implies that if you use uh, shortest paths to define who is neighbor of whom, well, who is member with whom in a block node, you will easily stop your coarse graining process because in a few steps, you reach from a given node, you reach any other node in the graph, right? So the small, uh, the small world property implies that there is no, not enough separation along shortest paths, basically, between neighbors. In such, such that you can iterate your coarse graining scheme uh, uh, indefinitely, okay? Um, of course, I, I want to think also of infinite graphs, but the main question here is for the physics of real graphs. So, I, so we should also think necessarily about finite graphs, okay? And then, so let's think about finite graphs, then if you want, you may... I want to take some asymptotic limit in, in this reasoning, but let's focus on, on finite graphs. Okay, and then the most multi-scale problem is what I just mentioned before. So sometimes in your network, the heterogeneous coarse graining is already uh, embedded in the sense that your data may come where, um, in such a way where nodes, some nodes are defined at the microscopic level, but other nodes are actually aggregates of nodes. You may have the rest of the world node, which maybe you need to include. For instance, if you have a dynamical system defined on top of your graph, if you have, say, a food web, so a network of species uh, that evolve according to uh, Lotka Volterra, for instance, equations, you do need a root node which is supplying energy uh, to the entire system. So there is a, an anomalous node, which is the, 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 the totality of the external environment, for instance, which is supplying resources, you need to keep that node in the description. Otherwise, you're, uh, well, you might have an unstable system, whereas the true system you want to model is stable. Okay, so these are motivations. And this is a short, very, very brief uh, account of what has been um, proposed so far in the literature in terms of um, uh, say approaches to coarse graining networks with this renormalization idea in mind. Very, very quick here. Uh, so the, one of the earliest approach is uh, reminiscent of a box counting method for fractal analysis, basically. So the idea is that, okay, we don't have regular lattices that will have to be coarse grained onto other regular lattices, but maybe we can think of fractals where you have a generator, okay, and this could be deterministic fractal or random fractals. But I mean, you have a generator which you can then use to iterate the construction of your fractal. And, uh, and then, the, and, and you know, when you want to compute things like the fractal dimension of a, an empirical object, 
you, there are constructions such as a correlation dimension or uh, box counting methods where basically you get trends that relate how properties of the system change as you change the, the scale, the fundamental length scale in the system, right? What is the fundamental problem in these approaches is that, again, there is no fundamental length scale in graphs. So what, what, what is the metric, okay, according to which you should define length and the, the scale transformation that you need in order to zoom in and zoom out, okay? Uh, then one other, say, immediate suggestion would be, well, then look at communities. So if the network has communities, so if there are groups of nodes that are more tightly interconnected, more densely interconnected inside, then you would assume or expect, according to a certain null model, uh, then consider those as the block nodes, okay? The question is that you don't have control typically on how many communities are there. So different networks may have different numbers. Some networks do not have communities if you pick a quite structured null model. Um, and the question, and if, even if they are, then maybe you find the coarse graining corresponding to communities and then you stop because then by definition, there will not be communities be, between these communities unless you really think of a nested community structures with sub-communities within sub-communities and so on, okay. Okay, and then here comes the geometric uh, modeling idea. So uh, the, the hyperbolic model is a model that became very popular because very parsimoniously explains a number of properties that real networks have. If you assume that nodes live in some hidden hyperbolic space, so if you sprinkle points at random in a hyperbolic space, connect them uh, more likely if they are closer in a hyperbolic geodesic, then you would get for free power low degree distributions, local triangles, so local clustering coefficient that does not vanish, uh, assortativity profiles that look very much like empirical ones. And if you cluster these nodes somehow in space, so if the if they, if they are not entirely uniformly distributed in the hyperbolic space, you can also get communities. So locally, you have more neighbors than elsewhere, okay? So here, the, uh, so here, the type of questions are mainly related to, okay, how can we make sure that real networks really come from such a model? Can we retrieve these coordinates uh, somehow with in statistical uh, methods? What is the parsimonious choice of the dimension of the embedding hyperbolic manifold? What is the genus maybe of, of the manifold? Of course, there are all sorts of questions. So this is in a sense the starting point because once, so yes, Rajat. Yes, there are several algorithms that have been proposed. One of the most used is called the Mercator, which basically uh, is based on a maximization of a likelihood where the parameters are uh, the two coordinates per node that in a two-dimensional hyperbolic manifold, you assume nodes are sprinkled there, or there is an equivalent projection onto the Poincaré disk where basically you have a radial coordinate and an angular coordinate. So you fit these two parameters per node, basically, and this gives you the most likely coordinates. Of course, this is all up to some overall invariance, clearly, but, uh, but then this is providing you with the most likely embedding, uh, geometric embed. Okay. Um, okay. Then it's, it's a goodness of fit procedure, right? So even if you will find some best fit, the question is, is that fit still good enough, okay, or, or not? Okay, so, but, but all these approaches do not, say, reduce toward, to the ordinary scheme in which you have a simple lattice. So imagine you, you want to include in the class of networks to which you apply these models also the good old uh, um, lattices, and they, they break all these conditions. So these methods are based on assumptions. So the assumption of self-similarity in some sense up there, the assumption of the existence of communities, the assumptions of the properties that are compatible with hyperbolicity. So for instance, if your network is not scale-free, you cannot embed it reasonably in a hyperbolic space. So then the procedure breaks down, including for hyperbolic, uh, uh, sorry, for regular lattices. Okay, 
and the multi-scale notion, so the fact that certain nodes are aggregates of other nodes is not easily implemented here as well. Uh, finally, there is a class of approaches here, just pick one, which are based in, on, if you want, renormalization more a la, a la Wilson rather than Kadanoff. So not real space renormalization, but more in terms of the Laplacian, so in terms of the spectrum. So there are approaches based on, on Laplacian. This is the, the, the Laplacian of the form uh, a diagonal with degrees minus the adjacency matrix, but Luca has, so this is basically diffusion-based renormalization. So you aggregate uh, uh, by averaging out the, the fast modes, okay, and then the, um, and then basically there is an idea of diffusion proceeding on the graph, and then uh, given a certain typical time scale, you course grain the nodes that have been already, already visited by the diffusion process. But for instance, other works like what Luca uh, is doing with his uh, random forest approach is based more on random walks, uh, where the Laplacian is an, another one, if you want, in a sense. But, uh, but the idea is similar, okay? And so then the, the key uh, assumption, well, idea there is uh, uh, about lumpability, uh, basically, of, um, of the processes that you define. Okay, so this is basically uh, what is there. I mean, the main attempts that you find in the literature. So our idea was the following. Assume that all of these methods work or that none of this works. For us, it's in a sense the same. Uh, but then you have a problem that someone might give you, given your problem, someone might give you its own recipe for, okay, what is the best coarse graining scheme for this network, okay? Or you may invent your own one because you are unhappy with all of the previous approaches. Or you have a specific need. So I want first to see, okay, what are the, the firms in a given region of the country doing among themselves? So I need to aggregate geographically uh, because this is my own need. So I don't trust or don't care what the other methods would say, but I really need to know what, is, what the network looks like at that particular scheme of aggregation. And so assume that your input now is a partition, actually is a sequence of nested partitions, okay? And then the question is, okay, let's, let's assume that this is arbitrary. So let's see whether we can now work out a random graph model that remains in a sense that I will try to illustrate consistent across any possible hierarchy of nested partitions. What do I mean by the, uh, the model remain consistent? So that the functional form of the model, if you think of graph probabilities, now you have an ensemble of possible graphs with probabilities attached to each possible configuration. Any given partition will collapse this set of nodes onto a reduced set of nodes, and there will be an induced set of graphs with smaller size and then an induced probability distribution over those. Uh, is this probability distribution at the next level the same functional form as the, the probability distribution at the previous level? Or are you now looking at a different model, basically, of the same system just because you are observing it at a different scale? Okay. And you can think of iterating this and wondering whether there is a unique point, in a, in a fixed point in some sense of this flow, Okay, whether the, the graph probabilities will look the same then eventually. Okay, so this is the, the physical idea. Uh, let me skip this because for mathematician is not needed. Um, okay, so then the rules of the game are, are the following. You start with a finite graph, then you uh, specify, and, and we call this the L graph, where L stands for a generic hierarchical level at which I'm looking at the system. So I'm looking at the system at level L. L could be zero if you have a native starting point where you say my nodes are, are those at the microscopic level. Are, we are a level zero. And then we identify, we specify a partition that will map and we call a partition omega, partition of the nodes that will map basically my graph onto a reduced graph where nodes that are in the same block of the partition. So omega decides who are the circles. The circles will become nodes here. And then the topology of the graph will decide whether the nodes are connected or not in the 
uh, coarse grained network, okay? So here, this would be then from level, say, zero to one, or generically from L to L plus one. And then um, the, the rules is that I connect two nodes if there were at least one link, so at least one edge uh, between any pair of vertices in the two blocks, okay, corresponding to the new nodes. This is because if, for instance, if you truly have data, and if you're interested in a binary graph model of your data, this is exactly what you will see, right? So if you start with individual firms and then you uh, coarse grain, you will see, okay, are these two blocks of firms connected? You say yes, if there is at least one link, and you say no, if there isn't, right? So we, we are working in the world of binary graph models, okay? Not weighted graphs, okay? That That is work in progress uh, at the moment, yes. Um, the, the point is that the binary nature will have to be compatible, well, sorry, the weighted graph model will have to be compatible at the binary level with this one for the idea to work, right? So in a sense, the binary model is the first step uh, to go through. Okay, um, so clearly this is an OR process. So if there is at least one link, then here, then I put one link there. Here, there is no link whatsoever, so those two blocks are left um, unconnected. So the adjacency matrix at the next level, L plus one, has the, these elements, which this, this is nothing but an OR operation between all pairs of nodes inside the, the two blocks, okay, at level L. Okay, so this is the relationship between the adjacency matrices. Uh, of course, it's a surjective uh, mapping, and this means that imagine you are at level L, and now you have a random graph ensemble. So not just one graph that you know how to map to the coarse grain graph, but now you have a model here. So here along the vertical axis, you can think of your probability distribution for the adjacency matrices of the graph at level, the possible adjacency matrices describing your graph at level L, okay? And then, uh, so you have all possible graphs on that number of nodes, binary, simple graphs, simple graphs. But we allow for self-loops, not multiple edges, but self-loops. Why? Because then when you have a, uh, a set of nodes that becomes collapsed onto a block, you would like to put a self-link, so, sorry, a self-loop, if there were at least some link inside. Because you may decide to make a very weird partition where you say, I put all nodes together that have no link at all among themselves. This is a, an allowed partition. In that case, we will know that the uh, link, the, the corresponding node will not have a self-loop, okay? Okay, so but the, what is the key point? You have a random graph model here at level L. You have a partition that will map now this ensemble of graphs onto a smaller set of graphs at the coarse grain level. So uh, there will be an induced probability distribution for all these graphs. Okay, you have to, I mean, do this kind of convolution. Basically, you have to sum the probabilities of all the graphs that are consistent with the same projected coarse grain graph. And this will give you what is the, the probability of that coarse grain graph at the next level. So the question is, is there a functional form of P? So imagine how P will depend on parameters, right? So it depends on the, the argument is the adjacency matrix, but it will depend on parameters that are parameters of your model. Yes? Yeah. Well, 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 what do you mean? What word? So the second one on the left is the self-reflecting, right? Second one on the left. Right. This one? No, because there's an edge Uh, right, right, that's true, that's true. And then for the third, there should not be a self-loop. Right, so this self-loop should be moved here. Yeah, right, good. So now you know the rules very well. <laughs> yes, that was, the, that was the trick. Okay, so but imagine now your probability has parameters, okay? The question is, is there an invariant form for this probability so such that 
you can get rid of this L here so that the functional form is the same. Uh, only the parameters of the, the, of the distribution of your graph will change in a way that it has still the same uh, structure, okay? Okay, so this is uh, basically how formally you can write uh, the probability of a given uh, graph at level L, given the set of parameters defining your models. And this has to be a sum over all compatible graphs at the previous level M, okay? And you can go also many levels below, of course, clearly. So you can think of, in the end, a partition of a partition is ultimately a partition itself, right? So you can think of having several layers in this uh, process. So you may start even very far from level M up to level L. Uh, you have to count uh, the probability, sum the probabilities of all the compatible small, fundamental graphs given a coarse grain graph. And then the question is, uh, can we identify a uh, functional form that is independent of this label here? So that only depends on the level through the parameters. And through the fact clearly that the dimension of the argument is different. So this reads a matrix with a certain dimension and the other one reads a matrix with smaller dimension. Okay. So the general question is for us unsolved at the moment, but if you restrict to the class of models with independent edges, then there is a unique answer to the problem. So independent edges means that your probability uh, will factorize onto pairs of nodes, okay? So this is, uh, so this is then, um, you can think of a homogeneous random graph model, basically. So then um, your parameters will be the parameters of the homogeneous random graph, okay? It contains the Erdos-Schren if there is only one global parameter. It contains homogeneous random graphs of, a, say, rank one, if there is one feature for every node that you are specifying. But it could be a dimensional. They may, be, they may depend on vectors, like in graph embedding algorithms, for instance. Okay, so if, so in general, we think of now probability uh, in this form, where now the set of parameters will contain at least a global parameter, which you can think of as uh, tuning the overall density of links in your graph. These graphs need not be sparse, okay? So you, you are free to choose the level of sparsity through a global parameter. Uh, you, we also say that at the very least, there should be node-specific parameters attached to every node. You can think also of adding dyadic factors, like dependence on distances, for instance, like in geometric uh, random graphs, or uh, membership to communities, like in uh, block models, for instance. Uh, we may go even higher order, but it's a bit strange, I think, to conceive of parameters that involve triples uh, or higher order uh, groups of nodes if the edges are ultimately independent, right? So I would stop at the dyadic level. Otherwise, we have more parameters than degrees of freedom to, uh, to model. Okay, then what is a trivial solution for this problem? Where well, when all the PIJs are one, because then we have just a deterministic ensemble where only the complete graph is possible at a given level. And now you make any partition of the nodes, you will still see a uh, complete graph and then so on. Okay, so in a sense, the complete graph is a trivial fixed point of this renormalization flow. Okay, are there other solutions? Well, clearly the empty graph is another trivial fixed point empty graphs remain empty, whatever the partition. So are there non-trivial solutions? And our answer for the moment is yes, there is a unique solution in this space of uh, models with independent edges. Uh, and the solution is unique as soon as you demand how the parameters of the model transform. So if you have parameters attached to nodes, so the weights, for instance, in inhomogeneous random graphs, node weights in homogeneous random graphs. And you demand that upon blocking a set of nodes onto one macro node, you want the weight of the macro node to be the sum of the weight of the fundamental nodes, then the solution is unique. If you dem and, and it's this one. If you say, no, no, I'll, I want to multiply all the weights, 
then there will be another corresponding unique solution with a log somewhere that accounts for the difference. Okay, so that's the, that's the idea. So for the, if you demand some additivity in the node parameters, then there is a unique solution, which is this one. And what turns out, and then this means that at every level of resolution, so given any partition of your nodes, these probabilities will be consistent all the way. And these can be very heterogeneous partitions. You can construct a monster node containing half of your network and leave the other nodes as they are. This will also work. And the renormalization re rules for the parameters are the following. So delta is a scale invariant parameter. So delta does not change as you coarse grain your graph, okay? So delta is really one free parameter globally. You don't have to adjust this parameter as you change the resolution level. The uh, node specific parameters are additive. So this is then their renormalization rule. When you move from individual nodes to a block, you have to sum over nodes in that block. And finally, the, um, if you want the dyadic factors, which can appear here at the exponents uh, as arguments of a, a monotonic function. So F has to be a monotonic function. Uh, well, need not be monotonic, but I mean, it's reasonable that you are thinking of parameters such as distances, such that the closer the two nodes, the less likely their connection. Uh, in that case, F has to be decreasing. Or you may think of similarities where now more similar nodes are more likely to be connected and F has to be increasing. Okay, I mean, given F, the renormalization rule for this term is then this fitness averaged, uh, this fit, fitness aver weighted average, weighted by the, the fitness, where by fitness I call the node parameters. Okay, as I said yesterday, there is a reason for this because there is an, a model which is popular among physicists, which is called the fitness model but you can call them weights and it's the same thing, okay? Okay, so this is the, it's straightforward to prove all this clearly. So this is not the key thing. I think the, the, the nice thing here is the physics that, that is behind. So with this um, model, our proposal is now to study properties of it as a model of real system on one hand. And then it means we want to see whether there, there are systems that are well described by this model. So we need then to identify what are the relevant parameters for those systems. But, and this is the typical operation that physicists do when they have a model, they would like to see whether a real network is well replicated. But the nature of the model is such that you don't have to stop at a given resolution level to be happy with your model. Now you have to make partitions, coarse grainings, uh, and check whether the model remains consistent with any coarse grain version of your system. Then as a physicist, you would be happy that your model works well, not at a single scale, but at all scales simultaneously in a sense. We know that mathematically other models with edge independence cannot do this simply because you, uh, they, they lose their functional form, okay, as you, as you coarse grain them. Yeah. 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 I know. Probably I see what you mean. No. Uh, sorry, this is not so clear mathematically. I'm not defining an f function through this equation. I'm saying, f if f is monotonic, it will uh, depend. Uh, okay, monotonically on the argument. So I want to renormalize the argument of f according to this rule. And as a result, since F is monotonic, its value will be renormalized accordingly. So this is not a definition for F. Pick the F you like, put it here, and then the implied uh, parameters, uh, arguments of F will have to renormalize in this way. So it also gets the sub-label. Yes, yes, so, so yeah, thanks for the question. This is by no means a definition for F. You can think of being linear in D or in one over D, I will pick one over D very soon. And then um, this is how you renormalize the Ds, the parameters D in such a way that when you put them back into the, onto the function, the, the model remains consistent. Yeah. So perhaps it's, it's positive, right, I'll, uh, so all the parameters have to be positive. 
because you, you don't want probabilities to exceed uh, one or become smaller than zero. And um, a monotonic because of this implication that you want to have from this formula to the corresponding formula on the distances. Yes. Okay. Well, delta. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, we we will see this. Uh, so now there are two scenarios that will open now very soon. One is when you have a real system, so you have no freedom choosing what x and d are, for instance, because you measure them. So maybe, well, I already say it, so I save time for later. If you know your nodes are countries in the world and you're interested in international trade between countries, there are lots of data that document this. This is called the International Trade Network. And then our uh, natural candidate for X is the GDP of every country. So you don't have to invent your X, it's coming from the data. Same thing for the distances. Geographic distances plays a role in international trade, so it's a natural candidate for this. So your only free parameter will be delta. Now, if you have a real network, then you want to match the uh, empirical density of, the, of your graph, for instance. That is a kind of method of moments for uh, setting delta. Then, then it depends on your real network, whether it's, if it's sparse or not, then delta will be either small or large. The other scenario will be, but also consider that if you start with a sparse graph and you start coarse graining, very naturally your partitions will increase the density of your graph. So then sparse or dense are a property of a single level in the description, not of the overall story. Okay. So given the values of X, there is a, a corresponding value of delta that realizes the density then these numbers will increase when you do renormalization. So delta will then not change. So the density will increase, not because of delta, but because of the, of the nodes becoming more and more important. Uh, the other scenario is what we call the annealed scenario, where now this is more like an homogeneous random graph. Now you decide what is the PDF from which you sample x, i. And given your choice of PDF, there will be a certain scaling of delta that can make your graphs dense or not. We will, in the end, pick a marginally sparse or dense case, so where the density is log n over n in the end. Okay, so now I go faster because I already explained this slide. So the quenched case this is what we call quen. I know physicists and mathematicians would need three hours to agree what quenched and annealed is. For us, quenched means simply these parameters X are numbers given. I measure them. I cannot change them anymore. And I want to describe the properties of a model as a function of this vector of values, period. This is quenched because someone quenched these numbers for me. Poor me. <laughs> and uh, annealed instead is the scenario where I now think of these numbers being picked from a certain PDF. This, for me, will add a layer of complication because if I want to enforce additivity, sorry, consistency of the model, again, across multiple levels, I also want consistency of the PDF from which I'm sampling the weights, which leads me directly to alpha stable distributions for the X values because the, the renormalization rule is additive, so they have to be stable upon addition. They cannot be negative, so I discard alpha equal to two. I don't like Gaussians here. I have to go to one-sided alpha stable distributions with purely positive support, which leaves me with alpha between zero and one, so they are infinite mean hidden variables, okay? And the uh, Levy distribution, alpha equals to one half, is the only one known in closed form in that range, but we will give results for, for any alpha in the range, basically through the characteristic functions of these processes. Okay, so this is done. Application, so now relax, think of a very small network, uh, less than 200 nodes, because countries in the world are around 200, depending on definitions and agreements. Um, but the data that we are using has uh, 180 something countries. This, this network is very dense, already at the beginning. It's very dense, more than, density is more than one half. 
okay, you would definitely call it a dense graph. This is only a filtered version of it, by the way. Otherwise, you couldn't see the graph because of so many links being there. As I said, yeah, sorry? Yeah, now this is just a caricature. This, this, is, um, this is the output of a paper where they propose a filtering procedure, which is very uh, complicated. It's based on a null model where every node has a controlled number of connections and total volume of exports and imports. And then this is actually the filtered graph, which is the part which is less consistent with that null model in a sense. So this is the surprising part of the graph if you already control for the local connectivity of nodes and their local strengths or sizes of exports and imports. So it's not there to illustrate what I'm saying next. It's just because it's one of the few pictures where you can see these links, otherwise it's too dense, okay? <laughs> Uh, okay, so we go back to the native data. So the data among all possible trades between all possible countries. And as I said before, well, there is already literature, which I don't review here, that has already shown that with this particular network, a very natural fitness parameter that you can attach to nodes is the empirical value of GDP, total GDP, not per capita GDP, total GDP, and um, which is an additive feature. So for us, it's already very easy. This step is the easiest. We have a natural candidate for the fitness parameter uh, for, the, for the nodes here. We take them to be empirical values of GDPs. Then there is also literature uh, in economics showing, but less so in economics for the existence of trade connections, more about the volume of trade flows. But I mean, there, there is literature partly in economics and partly in physics, where uh, distances were shown to play a role in the existence of links. So we take geographic distances here, and, uh, and we take the inverse function, okay? And this, uh, again, comes from some understanding in economics where the gravity model uh, of international trade has this particular form, okay? Well, it has fitting parameters, but once you fit the parameters, the values are very close to this form here. So the inverse of the density is uh, well accepted in, uh, in the literature there. Okay, so our renormalization rules for the distances, for the F, if you want to now imply this relationship. It is the distances that have to renormalize in this way, not the F function, even though here the F function is one over X. Okay, so if we plug these uh, choices into the general recipe, which is our solution for this scale invariant model, we get this model here where now we have only the free parameter delta remaining. So now it's a one parameter model, it's just one parameter to fit, okay? So the question is whether uh, now given the empirical network, we can uh, fit delta in a way that, okay, we, we decide how to fit delta. So we impose that delta replicates the empirical link density at that native level of resolution. And then we see what the network model predicts for all the other properties without refitting anything, okay? Next, we coarse grain the different nodes without refitting delta because that's done, okay? And see whether the model is still predictive across different levels of aggregations of countries, okay? It's one parameter model. Okay, so this is what we find in terms of uh, various properties. These are now overall properties, so not node by node yet, as a function of n, which is implicit for as a, as a, as a function of the aggregation level. Okay, so what we do is we start with these 180 something nodes. So you see n is inverted here. As we coarse grain, we move to the right because n becomes smaller, okay? And what we are showing here is in blue, it's the observed values on the real international trade network that knows nothing about GDPs and distances. It's just a database of link relations, trade, international trade relationships. Uh, the, the parameters that we put in are coming from different data. They are the list of GDP values and the list of geographic distances between countries, okay? So here we see the observed uh, in blue, the observed points and the expected values from the model, okay? As ex expected values and expectation over these probabilities. So by design, we are fitting delta 
in such a way that this one point here coincides. So in this one point, the blue and the red coincide because we are imposing the delta is such that the empirical density at level zero is the same as the expected density of links, okay? Then we release basically the model and we first check at the same level whether the average assortativity is consistent or not and the local clustering coefficient is consistent or not. And where here by assortativity, I mean the average nearest neighbor degree. So the object that define, the Frank defined. So it's, this is the average degree of the neighbor of a given node. Now average over all nodes. So that's why it's just one point in the end. And now the local clustering similarly, this is the local clustering coefficient. So the fraction of triangles around a given node, average overall nodes. Okay, so it's not the global clustering coefficient, not the number of triangles divided by the number of wedges. How, it, how yeah, okay. So here I don't have to, the very first line, this is the native network. Okay, now we start coarse grain in the graph. And since sometimes in my audience, there are also economists, uh, we want to make an economically meaningful choice of partitions. So we cluster them according to geography. So we take the list of geographic distances, the same that appear here. And then we, uh, through a um, hierarchical clustering algorithm, we identify the pairs of countries that are closest to each other. So we construct a dendrogram basically, where different countries are the leaves, and then the heights of the dendrogram correspond to the closest ultrametric distance to the, geometric, to the geographic distance that we start from. So this is basically single linkage clustering, where given any two blocks of nodes, we define the distance between the blocks as the uh, short, the minimum of all the pairwise distances, this single linkage. You may take uh, average linkage, taking the averages, or complete linkage taking the maximum. But the single linkage one is the one that is guaranteed to provide you with a sub subdominant ultrametric, which means it is the closest ultrametric distance from below to the original distances. The original distances need not be ultrametric, but if they are ultrametric, this is beautiful because they come out of this summation. So if you have an ultrametric distance, you can always encode it in a dendrogram, right? If now you define blocks by cutting your dendrogram horizontally and collapsing nodes that are in the same branches, you will have that in, in this summation, all the distances from any node in one block to any node in the other block, they are the same because they have to arrive at the same branching point in the dendrogram. They have the same common ancestor. So this little number comes out of this and simplifies. Well, does not simplify, it comes out, but the rest simplifies. So the GDPs simplify, and then you see that the next level distances are unchanged. So not only delta is scale invariant in that case, but the entire distances, the entire set of metrics are uh, uh, unchanged. So only the additive rule on the uh, GDP remains in that case. Okay, so we cluster according to geographic distances and we pick, uh, I mean, uh, something like 18 levels of aggregation or, so, or something. So you see that the agreement between this empirical and observed properties remain fairly close, uh, irrespective of the level of aggregation. So here we are talking about very, very small graphs, okay? And this is very, uh, it's a quite remarkable agreement given that it's a one parameter uh, fit. But we also wanted to check things locally for every node. So here you see um, for a given, this is the native level again, where nodes are countries. And here you have the log of the GDP on the X axis. This is a scatter plot. And on the Y axis, you have here the degree of every node, the average nearest neighbor degree of every node, and the local clustering coefficient of every node. So you see the red is the model and the blue are the data. So this is quite, I mean, even with one parameter fit, I think it's a quite remarkable agreement. And as you uh, coarse grain, you see this agreement remaining uh, in place. Okay, so you don't have to refit anything here. Okay, so this is the part we are happy with uh, in terms of, okay, there, there is one example where this model uh, is working uh, well. 
And then very quickly uh, on the, what I mentioned, the annealed case, where now we get rid of the real world. So probably, uh, yes, yes, five minutes are enough. Uh, so here, uh, probably this comes closer to what uh, in the literature about uh, inhomogeneous random graphs has been studied or is typically of interest. So as I said, we want to now um, pick the, the weights from certain PDFs, but we want to impose this consistency again. So now we are bound to choosing only um, fitness variables that are alpha stable distributed so that any, at any level, we know that the fitness of a block, it's still alpha stable distributed. Of course, up to rescaling of parameters. So the rules of the renormalization of the parameters are as in the previous slides. But additionally, since the fitness are picked from alpha stable distribution, there will be a, the scale parameter of the alpha stable that will change accordingly. Uh, well, according to how many nodes I put together, okay? Uh, so if I do blocks of the same size, then they will still be all described by the same PDFs, okay? But the parameters will scale. But what is nice is that alpha doesn't scale. That's the property of stable distribution. So the alpha will remain what it is at all levels. So this implies, well, uh, that sometimes we can use the only known PDF uh, in this range, which is the Levy distribution, but sometimes we can work with the entire range of values and alpha has to be between zero and one. Okay, so one of the first results, so in this work is done, uh, started as uh, a project uh, uh, with my PhD students uh, in physics, but then became a collaboration with Rajat and Luca. So here uh, we found various results. One important one is that the degree, the expected degree of a node conditional on that node having a certain value X of the weight of the fitness uh, can be computed. And it has this structure here. So there is a um, range where for small values of the weights, the degree and the weights are not, not linear as you have in models with the finite mean, with the weights with finite mean. There is a no linear relationship and this is proportional then to the weight raised to the exponent alpha. So here you see square root because it's alpha equal to one half, but you can prove this uh, for any alpha. And then there is a clearly a saturation. So if you're considering especially denser and denser scenarios, now the degree will saturate, of course, to the maximum possible degree in that graph. But that's not the, so this is just an intermediate step for us to compute what is the degree distribution. So the distribution of expected degrees in, uh, in the model. And this turns out to have a power law uh, regime which is uh, characterized by a universal exponent uh, minus two. Okay, so the degree distribution has a, a universal exponent minus two irrespective of alpha. So again, you see this for the case alpha equal to one alpha, but we can prove this with an appropriate scaling of the parameter delta, okay, that this holds true irrespective of alpha. Now, when you have denser and denser graph, you see this uh, bending here towards large uh, for large values of the degrees. But if you pick a convenient scaling of the delta, you will be in the sparse enough regime such that the, the power law is, is a pure one. Okay, so these are then the more uh, rigorous results that you might probably uh, uh, like. Uh, so we simplified, so in a paper with Luke and Rajat, we simplified the setting from an alpha stable to a pure Pareto, just because of ease of computations. But we believe that any regularly varying function would, with the same tailored behavior would be equally, uh, would lead to the same results. So here uh, we, we consider this scaling of the parameter delta that here becomes uh, epsilon. So one first result is that the expected, if we pick this specific scaling of this prefactor here, okay, then the expected degree of a typical vertex scales as this epsilon to the alpha log epsilon to the alpha. So with this scaling here, this becomes a logarithmic. So on average degrees increase logarithmically. And then the asymptotic degree distribution, uh, so for a given, any given node will be a power law distribution where a cumulative exponent is minus one. So the PDF will be a minus two, okay? 
So, and again, this is you independent of the value of alpha. And then there is also result on the uh, dependencies between degrees. So you're interested whether these degrees all obey the same PDF, but whether they are, they are dependent or not. And we believe that they are not uh, independent. So there is dependence between degrees, but they are kind of tail independent in this sense. So that if you compute the uh, Laplace transform, basically of large degrees, okay, for large degrees, the Laplace transform factorizes. Okay, so if you take the small t and small s limit in the joint Laplace transform for the degrees, in general, this doesn't factorize, but if you look at the limit where t and s uh, vanish, it factorizes. So for us, this is signature of asymptotic tail independence for, for large degrees, but not for all of them. Okay, final results about triangles and wedges. So you can compute the average number uh, of wedges. It has a certain scaling with the parameter epsilon, and in the range we are exploring more closely, uh, this has this behavior here, so it's proportional uh, to n. But if you combine this with the, uh, well, with the relationship between wedges and degrees, basically, you can also get what is the distribution for the number of wedges of a given node. Okay, this is quite easy because you have a square number of uh, Edge of wedges given a certain degree. But then uh, if you combine this with the number of triangles, you get something very useful for the global clustering properties. So the global clustering coefficient. So the average number of triangles scales like the square root of n in this specific scaling limit. So taking together this uh, point 0.1 and point 0.3, we get basically the uh, sorry, that, that is in the next slide yet. But I mean, here uh, there is uh, the scaling that you that is convenient for the number of triangles uh, that gives you also what is the prefactor, okay? So not only the scaling, but the prefactor in how many triangles you have. But if you combine now triangles and wedges, you get that there is this specific scaling for the overall fraction then, okay, for the global clustering coefficients. This is something that we have seen also through simulations. So you see this uh, orange is the same as this quantity, but now on numerical simulations in the specific case where alpha is one half, where you can really sample these graphs. And you see that the global clustering coefficient vanishes as a function of density, but very interestingly, and we don't have a proof yet for this, the local clustering coefficient, which in a sense is the holy grail of models with independent edges, uh, remains very, very large. So it's definitely finite, I mean, but we don't have a proof for this yet because of the difficulty in handling uh, uh, infinite mean uh, random variables, okay? So this is uh, uh, the end. There are also results on the, the shape of these curves. They clearly converge to something, but this is numerical. And finally, connected as properties. So there is a particular prefactor in the scaling of this density that ensures that below certain value, there are isolated nodes and above it, there are uh, no isolated nodes. And that's it. Okay, sorry for taking long time. Diego, I lost you at the end because you're talking about renormalization. This means mm -hmm. you go from one graph to the gra right. next graph. Now you have a result about a large graph and properties of the large graph. How does this come out of your renormalization? Because of course, with renormalization, you say you want to renormalize, you want to do this right. uh, possibly a number of times. Maybe there's, there's some, some, some sort of attracting orbit. Uh, and, and I could imagine that you say uh, Levy-like is nice or in the neighborhood of Levy-like. Le but how do these results come out of your renormalization? Right. So renormalization here plays two roles. One is in defining, say, off the shelf, what are the shapes, what are the distributions that will remain invariant upon coarse graining. So alpha stable is the only one that works under additive choice. And uh, this particular form of the connection probability is the only one that remains itself basically upon rescaling. So the first role is that imposing the consistency of the model upon any possible sort of coarse graining, you get the same functional form. So in a sense there, you're already at the fixed point because by design, 
you are using results that are already for, for fixed point, for, for stability, basically, of this uh, question. The other thing is, okay, how do you then use this when you now introduce a coarse graining scheme? So now you are interested in given partitions, how do you use this? So for the, for the empirical uh, setting, I think it's clear. So you, you may define what, what you think are uh, useful partitions for you. And then you want to, I mean, you're, you want to be happy that if your model works at one level, it should work at next levels as well, right? So there, there is no preferred story. I mean, you, you are free to choose whatever partitions. Here, in our results here instead, so clearly, if we, say, we, if we are saying that all nodes are described by the same PDF, so if the, if the weights are IID from different nodes, then you, and you want these to, be, to remain true for blocks, then it means that blocks need to have the same size because then the alpha stable distribution will have a um, scaled scale parameter, but the scaling will be the same for all blocks because the scale parameter depends on how many nodes you put in the same block. And, uh, but, oh, but I agree that you can consider more general cases where now you have arbitrary partitions. So now your weights are still independent for blocks, but no longer identically distributed. But, but, but would so, you be able to uh, come up with some kind of contraction argument that says everybody is after a, a sufficiently large number of iterations of your renormalization going to be attracted towards a Levy distribution like uh, set? Ah, well, th th that's a property of the alpha stable distribution themselves. Yes. So if, if you made you, you start no, from no, a no, no, because, you, because before you, you're not exactly in, this is your fixed point. But, but suppose you start outside a fixed point, are you going yeah. to be drawn after appropriate scaling to a fixed point? Yeah, there is a partial yes. Uh, well, one part of the answer is yes, the other is I don't know. So the part which is yes is that, of course, if you start with a huge set of nodes and you have their um, weights, which are sampled from uh, uh, distributions with infinite mean, well, infinite variance, then you know they will be attracted by the generalized central limit theorem. They will be attracted to stable distribution, right? So the pure additivity of these weights will result in uh, the weight, so, so the sum, the total weight inside the block will tend to be uh, alpha stable distributed. The part I don't know is the P, the PIJ. So if you want to require also this for any, if you start from any edge independent model, you want to be attracted to this particular edge independent model, then that I, I don't know. And, and, it's, and it's a very important question. Can you show me the picture back of the uh, local clustering? Yes. Uh, how large is your network? No, the, the other, the previous. Uh, I think 10,000, I think 10,000 nodes. Okay. I would guess that in the large graph limit, for every alpha, it should converge to one, the local clustering, as the network size tends to infinity. It could be. This is something that I we... I mean, the, the, the reason is very simple. Uh, a, a typical node will only be connected to hubs, and all the hubs are connected to one another, so local clustering is one. Yes, I, I agree. We don't have a proof for this. We are seeing now spectral properties of this... Uh, networks generated by this. And it really seems that there is a huge role played by stars. So indeed, there seems there to be nodes. Well, so you see the, the largest eigenvalues as clearly arising as the, the node in the largest star, basically. And this star indeed are uh, order n, definitely. The nice things, but this is, I mean, something we are just uh, exploring now, is that there seems to be a log n number of such outliers in the spectrum. So that might correspond to log n number of stars of size n, basically, in the graph, which also contribute to a lot of clustering, clearly. A lot of local clustering. Yeah. Let's take the discussion offline and just go again. Yeah, thank you.